Or it calls an airplane for me. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked for an airplane? No. Um, it depends on how smart your phone is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Let's go away from this problem. Is there anything else before we get into 4 2? Okay. So 4 2 is a weird little dude just out of nowhere. But it, it's used a lot. In a lot of different parts of um, math. So we start with Rolls theorem. And um, let me ask you this. Let me see. Uh, I'm going to kind of assume something about what's going on here. Let's say that. I have something like this. F of A equals F of B. You with me? So what's the simplest way to make that happen? Well, right? Okay, so that's the, the boring, the, the trivial solution to how to kind of connect that together. Um, what's got to happen? Now, now, I'm not putting any restrictions down at all. I'm, uh, is there any... How would I start here? How would my function get there? It could just go straight there. What's the more interesting thing it could do? You use the same slope. Cross the Don't go there yet. Huh? It could cross the x-axis. Sure, Google. Hi. Right? I mean, could do all kinds of stuff. One thing it can't do, of course, is it can't, you know, obviously, it's got to be a function. But I haven't given it any restrictions, so couldn't it, could it do uh, this? Right, if I don't give it any restriction. Okay, so that's where we start to think about what if I want a specific thing to happen? So I'm kind of attacking this theorem backwards, just to do it differently. Um, let's say I want it to be so that there's a point somewhere in the middle, somewhere between A and B, where the slope is flat. It matches this slope, the straight across slope. I want those slopes to match. I want it to be parallel somewhere in the middle. So obviously I can't let what I just had up here happen. So what must be true about f for this situation where it jumps? It must be continuous. So 1, f must be continuous on a, b. There's something else also. If I want... So the simplest way to imagine this, of course, and this is the first thing you guys thought about, was if, if we just connect it with a nice parabola, right? But isn't there another way? Couldn't I do something funky like that? And what's wrong with that? That's a classic example of where what happens. It's not differentiable at that point. So the, the point where it would do what I want it to do, it's not even differentiable there. So the second restriction I must have is F must be... Differentiable everywhere. I don't even know why I'm writing. It's all in the book. There. Must be differentiable on A, B. And then the last restriction is the one I already put up here. F of A equals F of B. So if all three of those restrictions hold, and this is why I want to come at this backwards, if all three of those things hold, there is no way to not have a place in the middle where the slope is zero. It's got to be continuous. It can't have any sharp cusps. The derivative has to be, you must be able to find the derivative of every point in there. It's got to be continuous. There's absolutely no way for this dude. So it's like, I can't go straight because then right off the bat, I'm screwed. If I go straight, bam, there's C right there next to A. Uh -huh. Right? Or any point, we just go straight all the way across. So I've got to go up or down, but the minute I go up, I've got to come back, and I can't just jump there because I'm not allowed to be discontinuous. I can't turn the corner really quickly and, and get it because I've got to be differentiable. So I don't care what you do, there's got to be at least one place where okay. f prime is zero. So if these three things are true, there exists a point 
C, A less than or equal to C less than or equal to B, where F prime is C equals zero. Right, it's a very fancy way of saying it's got to be someplace where it's got horizontal tangent line. But the reason I said it the way I did, that it was parallel to what this straight across thing would be, is because there's a very simple generalization of this. Rolle's theorem is a specific uh, example of the mean value theorem. And what the mean value theorem says is, okay, what if this was turned on its side? I don't have f of a equal f of b. All right, it's too simple of a situation. So the mean value theorem would be something like So here's A, B, and F of A, F of B are different, whatever the hell they are. But there's definitely a slope here. In fact, what is that slope? It's constant, this is true, but what is it? No, what is it? Is it A squared minus B? Square root of C. Why was it nice to speak? How do you find the slope between two points? So f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Right? You guys with me? Yes. I mean, these, so often you'll hit a theorem that you never thought about it, because why the hell would you? But then when they present it to you, you're like, well, why not? Of course, that only makes sense. So if this makes sense, then what we're about to say here makes sense, too, because this is just that situation twisted. So it, that is the idea of if something's true when the axes are like this, very often it'll be true no matter how I put my axes. So what if I just twisted my axes? Then it would look like that. You guys kind of with me? Of course, linear algebra is all about taking your axes and twisting them around and rewriting all your equations with the twisted axes. Oh, oh shit, we'll leave that for them. But this is just the idea. I'm just trying to rewrite equations. Um, thank God. So what do you think I'm going to try to say here? Compared to the relative to this, what am I going to try to say here? First two the Yeah, so it's got to be continuous. It's got to be differentiable. The third rule's out. Don't need the third rule anymore. But what must be true in this case, there must be a C where F prime of C equals zero. No? no that's equals the same thing. Uh, so really, it's the same stupid thing here. What would the slope be here? Zero. zero. It's still F of B minus F of A over B minus A, which is a lot of work to say zero because F of B equals F of A. You with me? But I can actually set this one up the same way and just say this is a specific instance of that. So when I do it backwards, because it's easier to get a hold of this first, because we're so used to thinking about horizontal tangent lines, and then you say, twist it, bam. Now we're to a more general idea. That's the mean value theorem. So here, to finish this out, if this is true, in this situation here, there must be a there must exist. That's the symbol for there exists, the backwards E. There must exist a C inside A and B where F prime of C equals that. Basically, there must be a C where the tangent line is parallel to how you would go if you just went straight from A to B. I like the work I'm getting from some guys. So let's see a, a concrete example of this. Because this thing is really very vague. Uh, let's see. Let me get one out of the work here. Uh, here we go. So if we're given f of x equals square root of x. And it's for 0 to 4. So I want to find a c from 0 to 4. Let's check f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Now, before I even do that, 
why would I even start to do this problem? Does, does this function meet the requirements? Is the square root continuous? Yeah, yeah it's one of our continuous, a list of continuous stuff. So one continuous check is a differentiable. Yes, it's one of our differentiable functions on their domain, so that's differentiable. And then um, the, there's no third one here because I don't need f of b to equal f of a for the general mean value theorem. So where would you start this problem? It's almost solve. it's easier than you think. Solve. First solve for <clears throat> Do b minus a first to see if it even comes out to. So what's f of b? What's f of four? Two. Two. What's f of one? Uh, f of zero? Zero. Zero. Over four minus zero. So that's one half. So my slope target is one half. So really, what's going on here? If I graph a. Uh, So I'm trying to find, so I'm trying to, the um, tangent line's got a slope of one half. Uh, so I'll be going over two, so I'll be like. So I'm trying to find that point somewhere in there where the slope is the same. Not the tangent line, Jeff. I'm going backwards. Kind of giving it away. So from here to here, the secant line is this. That's the straight line that we can talk about. That's got a slope of one half. I want to find the point somewhere in the middle where the tangent line is, is parallel to that. That's the whole idea. I want the tangent line to the function to be parallel to, what if you just drove straight there? So now all you gotta do is finish out the side. The actual work is pretty simple. What is F prime? Yeah, so 1 over 2 root x. So what's f prime of c? f prime of x is 1 over 2 root x. f prime of c is 1 over 2 root c. I don't make a big deal. C doesn't even matter here. I used to argue with my teacher why I put a c there. But now I'm cool with it. Now c is a specific value. It's not any x value. So now I just got to solve this. And it's almost solved. I mean, what's c got to be? Can you just look at that and tell me? One, it's got to be one. One half, that guy's got to be one to make it stay one half. Right. So at one, the slope must be, of the tangent line, must be one half. That would be parallel to the line between the endpoints. Okay, how do you feel about that? I mean, that's the actual work involved with this theorem so far. Mean value theorem is used to prove so many other future theorems. It comes up all the time. So the tangent line at C is 1? No. C is 1. So I'm not sure. If you say the tangent line of C is 1, it doesn't make sense. What is C? C is just any, any point? So here's A, here's B. There's C is just somewhere in the middle? C is somewhere in the middle where what happens? The slope is The tangent line at that point. Is parallel to the tangent line, I mean the, the line through the endpoints. So C will always be the point where the tangent line at that point is parallel to the secant line through the points, the endpoints. There's chosen as functions to make it Pretty much. Yeah. Any function that's got that curve to it like that, it's gonna be nice to look at. Okay. Um, oh, here's a funky question. Let me see. I can't remember which one you guys have. Oh, look at this. I like this problem. Uh, 25, it says, is there a function, does there exist in a function f such that f of 0 equals negative 1? f of 2 equals 4, and f prime of x is less than or equal to 2 for all x. Let me just let you absorb that for a minute.
the reason I, I could have put this question to you as soon as we kind of understood derivatives. I could have put this question to you. So what's the mean value theorem say? What am I what's A and B in this in this setup? Zero and two. Yeah, zero and two are A and B. And of course, at zero it's negative one. And at two it's four supposed to be. Now somehow that function slope has to be less than or equal to two. The, so can you see what this is really asking you? Is that possible? How big of a slope must it have to even be able to get there? If it's got a slope of two, then you go up one, two over one, up one, two over one. I mean, even just doing that, do you guys see a problem? Yeah, it won't ever get there. It won't ever get there. If you only let it grow at a rate of at most two. two. You with me? So if, if it's like, whoa, that looks pretty high. Let me just stay at two all the time. I'm allowed to be at most two. Let me just stay at two. If it even just stays at two the whole time, it's only going to make it, what was it now? One, two, over one. One, two, over one there. It's only going to make it there. It's not going to make it up to there. So how does mean value theorem really come into play here? It says, what is the slope between the endpoints? Yeah, it's five halves. Yeah which is bigger than the allowable slope. So if the slope between the endpoints is 5 halves, the mean value theorem says that somewhere in there it's got to have a slope equal to 5 halves, right? That's what it says. If the slope here is 5 halves, no matter what the hell your function does, somewhere in there it's got to have a value of slope of 5 halves. You can have it the whole way, you can have it one place, whatever. But it's got to have a slope of 5 halves somewhere in there to have a chance to make it there. And if you restrict me to two, I ain't big enough. I can't do it. They're restricting you to the slope. Yeah, exactly. My slope is restricted to two. I can't reach the five halves that I need. Can't do it. Maybe. But see, that problem, even before I talked about mean value theorem, I could have talked about that problem. That's more, you could actually just apply like you just did. You just count and go, no, I can't make it up there. If you don't give me a slope big enough to get there, I can't make it there. Okay, let me see what else weirdness they have here. Oh, all right. Um, this, this is a very quick question, possibly. Let me see. Given x minus 3 to the negative 2, find c in... Just so I'm not completely evil, is anybody doing derivatives and stuff right now? You know, way too much work. What theorem are you trying, are you thinking about applying here? The mean value theorem, right? The move it theorem, MBT. What's required to use the mean value theorem? What must be true about the function you're trying to use it on? Ah, is it continuous on your interval? Is it continuous on your interval? Maybe if I wrote it, what's another way to write this? Uh, it's one over x minus three squared. So, no. so it's, it's three. It's going to yeah. be all 
three is going to screw you over. Now, the problem, I, I reworded from the problem. The problem I said, show that there is nothing there. But I want to make the point. Anytime you're about to apply a theorem to a problem, the point of the problem might be you can't use the theorem there. You don't want to do all the damn work, turn it in, and just say, you don't have to do any of this shit. <laughs> that sucks so bad. Trust me, again, personal experience. You always want to make sure before you apply a theorem that the requirements are met. If they're not met, you can't apply it. You say, screw it, can't do it, move on. Right? So be really careful when they say, you know, especially for this one, this one kind of gave it away, but somebody evil like me might give you probably this on a test and you might want to save some time. Now, now if you try to do this, let's see what happens if you try to do this. What's f prime of x? Cool. Alright, so then I have, this will be uh, negative 2, c minus 3 to the negative 3 equals, uh, what's f of 4? One, thank you. What's f of one? One fourth over three. Cool. So one minus one fourth is three fourth divided by three is one fourth. So I get this. You with me? So then I get negative eight equals c minus three cubed. How do I solve that? Cube root. So we C minus 3 equals negative 2. Add 3. I get C equals 1. Yeah, and the evil thing here is it's supposed to be between 1 and 4. Right? So you can't use that. So you would come up with something that contradicts what, what it's supposed to be. But the shortcut there is just the fact that the interval you're trying to look over, this thing does not even, is not continuous over the interval. I can't apply the mean value theorem. Now, if you can't apply the mean value theorem, does that mean that there is no place in there that does it? <laughs> Anytime I talk about proofs, I always get a little glazed over look from people, but just because it breaks what it needs to work doesn't mean the results are not true. That's, that's logic, right? If you make an A, I'll give you 20 bucks. If you don't make an A, I can still give you 20 bucks if I felt like it. So if you have a function that does not match the requirements, then anything can happen. It could happen, it could not happen, it could happen 80 times. You kind of with me? So that's the way a lot of theorems are set up. If you meet the requirements, it's guaranteed you'll have find this. If you don't meet the requirements, who knows? I don't know. Shit. It might happen. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But here I can't even use the mean value theorem from the beginning. I'm trying to use an interval where it's not continuous. So I just can't apply it. Okay. So that's for two. So now what I really want to focus on tonight is four three. And I think what I want to do is, I'm not just going to go straight through, because we've done some of this uh, stuff earlier, and I did that on purpose. Um, we've already, for example, can somebody help me out? Um, can you find... Local maxes and mins. Notice I've given you what? The derivative. The derivative already, just to cut to the chase. Can you find the location of any local maxes and mins? Well, there's two possibilities, right? What are your critical values? Now, how do you verify if they're max or local max or local? You plug them in back to the regular equation to see how. Careful. That's if it's absolute. Absolute max and min doesn't care about all the little details in the middle. They just want the biggest and the smallest. That's why it's nowhere near as hard as a question about local max and mins. 
Say again? Look at the multiplicity. Cool. In conjunction with this dude here. So you got your negative 5, you got your 2. If you plug in a 0, what sign do you get? Positive. I love it because it's positive times positive. What's, what's the multiplicity of the 2? 2, even, which means it's going to stay, odd is not going to change sign, right? And of course here the multiplicity was odd, so what's it going to be back here? It's going to change sign. Are you guys cool with that? Like a cubic? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, a cubic really refers to the shape of any odd powered polynomial piece, right? So the negative would be a min and two wouldn't be equal. Yeah, this is going down and up. So this is definitely the min. Yeah. This neither. is neither. How, uh, how do you know what's on the left side if it goes positive? But because the multiplicity is 2, which means the sign oh, will not change. Yeah, it'll actually right. turn. It's positive, and then it'll turn and stay positive. Like a parabola? Like a parabola. Because it's a square. That's what you're talking about when you're talking about. I love it. Alright, so that stuff I already told you about, and that's actually part of section 4.3, but when we were talking about this kind of stuff, I didn't see any reason not to throw this in. So you can actually draw a really rough sketch. Try to draw a rough sketch. Of course, it's going to be stupid rough, because I don't even know what F is. You can figure out what, what the regular function is, right? Not easily. And that's actually the second half of this class. It is actually not the second half, but like the back third, I guess you could say. It is the opposite of derivative, which is integral. This would not be an easy one to integrate, believe it or not. Well, not the way it is. You can multiply the thing out. Um, so this here tells me what? Down. It's headed down, then it flattens out, of course, then it's headed up, and then it flattens out, and then it still heads up. It doesn't flatten out forever, but this is just a rough sketch. That's a sketch of what? No. The derivative. No. That's a sketch of f. Why is it a sketch of f? Because this is the slope, but I drew it. What's the slope tell me? It tells me what direction my f is headed. I don't know what f is, but the slope tells me the function is headed down, flattens out, as a minimum here, heads up, flattens out, heads up. That is a sketch of f. You guys with me? And it's so easy to mix that up. You're like, well, this f prime, we just, but no, we're looking at f prime as telling me what my f is doing. That's what this, it tells me what my, my function is doing. Um, I had a point, another point there for you. Oh. Shoot. Oh, that's right. Why does this make sense? What's the end behavior on my F? What kind of, what kind of, uh, what my end behavior looks like, what? Does it look like cubish or par parabolic? parabolic? Parabolic. So it should be like X squared or X4. It's like X to the even, right? My function should be X to the even. What's my derivative? X to the fifth power, right? So it came from X to the sixth power, so that makes sense. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. These are all little things that are on the side. You don't necessarily have to know, but it's nice to know there's a check there. You can check it, yeah. So I drew the graph in the slope. You gotta go down, flatten out, go up, flatten out, go up. And now this looks parabolic. It should be X to an even power. My derivative is x to the fifth power overall, right? That must have been a derivative of x to the sixth power somehow. Oh, because they're both. Again, I don't know what the hell all the coefficients are and all that crap, but I know it's going to be a sixth degree. So this picture looks like a sixth degree thing that matches up, thank God. Does that always work like that? It's got to. Because the power will drop. Exactly. This is just pair of, uh, uh, polynomial. X to the sixth that drops out to x to the fifth. I like it. Cool. Okay, so what section 4.3, the, the new thing in section 4.3 that I want to really want to focus on is the second group. What the hell is that dude tell you? 
I like it. So in physics, if it's kinematics, we're talking about motion of some particle or car, then it's going to tell me acceleration. But I want to talk about it in less specific terms. Like I don't call f prime velocity, I call f prime slope. So I want to call f double prime something relative to slope. Somehow, so it's going to be a new word to us because we've never thought about this thing before. But let me show you the example here. So let's say this is f. f prime, of course, is going to tell me like f prime is negative here because it's headed down and so forth. That's f prime. So uh, why? F prime, why does it tell me that about a function? What is the derivative really at, at its heart? What's a nice phrase for derivative? Slope of a function. Even less specific than slope, believe rate it or not. Change. I like it. Perfect. It's the rate of change of what? So if I take the derivative of f, it's the rate of change of f. You with me? So what the hell must f double prime be? What did I just take the derivative of to get here? I love it. And I hate it when you say, you know, often they'll say the rate of change of the rate of change, and it's kind of like, okay, I just got lost in your sentence. But you say the rate of change of the slope, that's it. If you take the derivative of the slope, you get the second derivative. And the derivative always tells you the same thing, the rate of change of what you just took the derivative of. So it must tell me the rate of change of the slope. So where's the slope changing fast? Is the slope changing fastest? The Where's the slope like not change? Let me see. How can I say this? Um, what's the slope back here? Negative. negative. But what is the slope becoming? Nice. Zero. Yeah, it's becoming less and less negative. And now it's positive. So it changes most around the bend. Around the bend. And then right in here, Same. it's kind of like a... Uh, really steep. Going right along, it's not changing at all in there, really, right? It's going up, and then now it's going to start to change a lot around the bend. And I've had a really skinny parabola that changed like crazy around the bend. You guys with me? A little bit? Okay. So that's why if I go a certain velocity down a straight road, I'm fine. If I try to maintain the velocity, I'm going 80, and the little sign says 30, turn ahead, and I try to maintain that for some stupid reason, I'm probably going to feel that. And that's, that's what you're feeling right there. Right? The acceleration, it ain't liking it. And your car probably ain't going to hold on for that. So, how is the slope changing here? How is it changing? Is it, um, like here the function, the function is, is up, going up. So in this location, in this whole area, f prime is greater than zero. That's pretty obvious, right? Is, the function's going up. Function was negative, now the function's positive, so the, func the function was increasing, therefore the slope is positive. You with me? That's really just overanalyzing something we, we all know. So now talk about the slope in the same way. The slope was negative, negative and now it's becoming positive. positive. So around the bend here, the second derivative must be positive. The slope of my function is getting bigger. It was negative. Now it becomes positive. The same way the function was negative, and now it's positive. That's why, I mean, it's going up, right? That's why the first derivative was, was positive. Here, it's negative slope, and then it's becoming zero, and then positive. So back here, the second derivative must be positive. So where's the second derivative? Negative. Yeah, the other way. So what's the main uh, visual difference between this area here and that area there? I love it, exactly. Some of you guys have heard this phrase before. This is cup up, it'll hold water, and this is cup down. It's going to spill your water out, right? Is or whatever a, your beverage of choice is. Huh? Is this uh, f prime? Is this function that you drew, or is it just a regular? So right in here, f prime is positive because my position, my function values are increasing. So I was trying to make that analogy because f double prime and f prime have the exact same relationship with each other as f prime and f do. You guys cool with that? 
Because again, the second I take a derivative, the, the derivative doesn't give a shit what the hell the thing was in the first place. It's going to do the same thing all the time, the rate of change of the thing you just had, right? So if this means it's positive first derivative because it, it increased the values, here it's negative values, zero positive values. So the second derivative must be positive here because the values of f prime are getting bigger. So f double prime must be positive. The, the rate of change of the f prime must be positive. Yes? Is that why like when you take a let's say x to the 6, take the derivative of that, it looks like x to the 5th, and then you take the second derivative of that, it looks like x to the 4th, and then until you get like a, a straight line, you know what I mean? It relates to that. Yeah, it relates to that. We'll see why, we'll be a little more specific about that here in a minute. Um, one immediate thing to realize, now that I have this still up here, which is good for me, because normally I would have erased that, um, if, if f double prime of x is negative, can you do it in the air what that would look like? I like it. One person's going for it. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody else is like, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, so it's going to be cut down. So if I have a critical number right there, I do. if I have a critical number right there, could it be a max or a min? It's got to be a max, right? It's going down. So there's a much better test than this business. Nothing really wrong with this, but now we've got something better. If I knew, so at my critical value, if I knew what the second derivative value was there, if it was, if the second derivative here was, uh, in fact, what would the second derivative here be? We already know the shape of it, don't we? Positive. It's going to be positive, but if I didn't do this at all and I just took a second derivative and plugged the negative 5 in and got positive, I know that it would be the location of a min because it's cup up. There must be a minimum there. So that's what's incredibly called the second derivative test. So instead of doing this, which is the first derivative test, you can apply a second derivative test and get to the answer sometimes a little quicker. Here I might not want to do the second derivative. Uh, depends on what you feel like. Um, so let's see, let's do a problem, let's bring this back to concrete stuff here, blah, 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 okay. And I still have to talk about what are the critical points of the, um, and actually I'll talk about it right now since I have this picture here. Can somebody... Where does it go from concave up to concave down? Have we talked about that point before? Like if I were to graph the derivative of this, what would I start with? I'm going to graph the derivative of this function, what would I start with? The zero. The zero. So this is uh, flat and this is flat here. Here the slope is negative. negative. And then it's positive, right? Now, where's the peak going to be? We've talked about this before. There's that special point. So we've looked at it in a different way, and I think that word came up earlier, inflection point. But now it's going to be that place where it's, it, it's getting bigger, but somewhere near it's like constant slope for a second. And then it's getting smaller. That's going to be the peak. That's what's called the inflection point. That is exactly where it stops being cup one thing and cup the other thing. It becomes right. And that's not the easiest thing to see, but mathematically you can see exactly where that is. But you can normally get pretty close to where that is. And we've always we've done a decent job, I think, so far of seeing where that point is. You guys with me? Yeah. A little bit. Okay. So now you see the method to my madness. I like to pull things out early and then say, okay, here's a whole other way to look at that same thing. That's an inflection point. It's related to the second derivative. So that would be where my so inflection points. Um, let me see this. Critical points are where what might happen? Mix, uh, min and max. Yeah, where min and max might occur. I'm really, really writing horrible today. Um, inflection points are where Concavity might change. 
So truly, another way to say it to make it a little more uh, symmetric, critical points are where direction might change. It's going up, now it's going down. Inflection points are where concavity might change. It's cup down, now it's cup up. You kind of with me? Okay. Isn't, that, isn't that direction too? No, that's actually the change, the rate of change of direction. So that's a different thing. Yeah. All right, so first thing, real quick, get the derivatives of this, the first and second. What is that saying? Points are. are oh, I gotta be careful. I've used the wrong word here. And the weird thing is, all right, we we still use the word critical point, even for the for, we call it the first derivative of critical points, the second derivative of critical points. So, excuse me for this. Inflection point would mean it actually does change signs. So like critical point for the first derivative would be where there could be a max or a min, and then there is a max or there is a min. Critical point for the second derivative are where concavity might change, where there might be an inflection point. And if it does change, then there is an inflection point. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, but, but what does that say? Uh, where we are. So inflection points are where concavity does change. Point. You have a first derivative critical point, and you have a second derivative critical points, right? You can have a list of critical points for the first derivative, a list of critical points for the second derivative. They each are possible locations of, for the first derivative, what maxes and mins, for the second derivative, inflection points, where the concavity the actually changes. Does only apply to, the second to where it really does happen, so. But it only applies to second derivative. Only applies to second derivative. Good. So what do we have here for first derivative? 4x cubed minus 12x squared. Like it, second derivative? 12x squared minus 24x. Good. So where are my first derivative critical points? Zero. I like it. Zero is one of them. My critical values for the first derivative are 0 and 3. You cool with that? Just take the first derivative, factor it, and then see what makes it 0. What about for the second derivative? Oh, where do you go? 12x squared. So if you factor that, you get uh, x minus 2. So the critical values here are 0, 0 and 2. So far, so good. So how can I check if one of these is a max or a min, especially because I already have some work done up here? Would I draw the number line and do all that? No, would you, would you draw the second derivative? Now I can apply the second derivative test. What's f double prime of zero? So again, I want to make sure that you understand. I find a critical value. That's where it could be a max or a min. So if I look at that point, if I plug it into the second derivative and it's cup down, then obviously that's a max. If it's cup up, it's a min. If it's cup neither, right, is one of those places where it's changing or something, then that's not a max or a min. Or it's really, you gotta, you gotta, then you've gotta do the number line thing to really further investigate that. So it's zero, right? So what's f double prime of zero? Zero. 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 So it's neither cup up or cup down. One. Is that the inflection point? So we might have to investigate that further. But what's f double prime of three? Uh, yeah, the important thing there is it's positive. It's 36, which is greater than zero. So that was cup. That's cup. Positive. Uh, cup down. Or cup down. This is cup. No, it's exactly what you'd hope it would be. If it's positive, you'd hope it'd be cup. Oh. Up. That makes sense. Up for positive, right? So it's cup up. Which means at three, what is there? 
there's a neck. There's a mid. Yeah, we go so far. So for those of you playing along at home, on page 295, they have at the top. So that does that mean there's a min for f prime or f double prime? Or does that make sense? Okay, so everything we're doing is talking right now. We're looking at the second and first derivatives to tell us information about the function. Okay. So, oh, so that tells us that there's at the function. The function has a minimum at three. Uh, exactly. Okay. So but we're plugging in the critical numbers of the first derivative into the second derivative. And I'm hoping to God that makes sense. Because if I know what it's shaped like at that point, I'll know if it's a max or a min. In this case, it was shit. It was up, cup up. There must be a minimum there. Cup down and maximum. Cup down and maximum. I like it. Now, what's going on at zero? Look here real quick at this first derivative. I can see really easily. This, what's the multiplicity of zero? Even. Even, which means what's it going to do around zero? It's going to stay the same. Stay the same sign. So it's not going to be a max or a min. Right? But if you do get equal to zero, you do have to check it out a different way, because that's inconclusive. I was trying to see if they said that here. I have to look again. Blah, blah, blah. They don't even mention it. That's evil. Wow, that's really evil. See, on page 295, they have the second derivative test. If f double prime is greater than zero, then it's a minimum. If f double prime is less than zero, it's a maximum. If f double prime equals zero, you're screwed. Oh, here's an example. We have f double prime equals zero. Second derivative test gives no information. Okay, good. So they should have added another bullet to that little box. If f double prime is greater than zero, it's a min. Makes sense. If it's less than zero, it's a max. If it equals zero, you've got to check it out a different way. Second derivative test is inconclusive. So you use the first derivative? So you have to go back to the first derivative and do what we just did. It's an even multiplicity, so it must be nothing. Right? Whatever it's doing on one side, it continues doing it on the other side. It doesn't really turn. So it's not a max or a min. Uh, what's an example of if it wasn't an even multiplicity? Uh, if I would have made these powers higher, this would have been a cube here. Uh -huh. Then, that, then, what then that it would have changed sign, and then I would have had to actually would that be a analyze local? it. Would that be a local? Uh, yeah, a local something or other. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, let me see, where are we at? Do, 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 do. Oh, cool. So what about inflection points? Do we have any true inflection points? And where does it cup up? Where does it cup down? So first off, tell me this, before you get too far away from the uh, first year of this stuff here. Um, where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? Let's see if you guys can see this. It starts increasing at, from zero to three. So in this case, you might actually want to do this, right? From x equals zero to But you know it's, what's going on at three? What do you already know is going on there? It's, uh, it's a min, it's a minimum. Yeah, it's cup up, so it's a minimum. So you know it's got to be coming down and going up, so I know it's got to be negative positive, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, it stays the same sign around zero because it's an even multiplicity. How are we doing so far? Okay, cool. So where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? It's increasing from? From 3 to, three to infinity, right? 3 and then forever, because there's no other place that it could turn around. But we haven't found the cup down yet. Where is it decreasing? Not yet. And here's where it's a little evil. Negative infinity to 0. 0 to 3, because at 0, it's not increasing or decreasing. It's flat for a second, right? So you got to be careful about that. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, strictly increasing, strictly decreasing, right? So that's all first derivative stuff. Now let's look at the second derivative. Um, which one of these, are either one of those going to be inflection points? And I'm hoping you're at a point where, can you just look at the second derivative and tell me, are they both going to be inflection points or not? 
In order to be inflection point, what's going to happen around it? What's inflection point mean? Concavity. What about concavity? So an inflection point means the concavity changes. Which means the second derivative could be positive on one side, negative on the other side, or vice versa, right? Right. Now, what about this tells me the answer already? I don't know yet if it's a cup up or down, but I do know that both of those are inflection points. Why? They're both first degree. So I know the sign's going to change on both sides. I know they're inflection points, but I don't know yet exactly about concavity. Where is it up or down? But it's really easy to tell. I know. So let's see, if I look at this, and I, I probably don't even need to do this, but let's see, 0, 2. If I plug a 1 in, what sign do I get? Yeah, I get positive, then it's negative. And what's going to happen at both 0 and 2? What's going to happen around there? Sign's going to change because it's a odd multiplicity on both, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be positive out there, positive out there. So where is it uh, concave up? From two, um, two, add two, and it's... It's going to be on an interval. Oh, where Can't make concave? a complete cup unless you can actually get somewhere, right? So from what to what is it concave up? Zero to two. From one concave to up. One to three. Two. Negative three. infinity to two. Yes, negative infinity. To zero, and that's where oh. it's positive. And where's the concave down? And also, where else? Sorry. Two to, two two to, to infinity. infinity, and of course, it's concave down everywhere else. Zero to two. Cool. And of course, at zero and two, it's not either one, it's changing. That's exactly where it's changing from one to the other. Okay, let me just stay right there for a second. Yeah. I was trying to, I was trying to think about it. So, the it's concaving up. No, 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 no. Now you're thinking a little too much about it. This actually tells you exactly why zero is inconclusive. It's a critical value for both of these. So it's going to be zero at both. But at three, you're thinking about this. Where's three here? It's there. It's concave. Up at three. You guys with me? So you're thinking too much. You're trying to look at a specific point here when actually that was where we looked at a specific point. At three, it's concave up. We can see that now that we have this whole number line filled in. And that was for the first derivative? That was to see if it was a max or a min. Since it's cup up, it would be a min. Right? That's what we did that Right, for. that was our, when we were using the first derivative. Now, at zero and at two, it's not cup up or down. It's changing. Um, Just like at zero and three, it's not increasing or decreasing. It's changing. It's a turning point, so it's not increasing or decreasing. You see the analogy there? So at zero is when it's changing because the signs are changing? The, we looking at this one? Yeah. All right, so zero is definitely the location of an... The concavity... <laughs> What's it called? Inflection point. So inflection point at zero. What about two? What? What about two yet? You have to put zero in right here. Where? Into the, the y, y double prime. Zero, zero. If I do that, I get zero. Why? Yeah, I got to play it in here, I get zero again, but that's not because, uh, yeah. You, so this is the whole thing about, if you want to know the point, you plug it back into the original. I don't want to know the slope here, and I definitely don't want to know the concavity, because I already know its concavity is there, zero. I want to know where the hell is the actual point at. So let me ask you this. Uh, so concave, what is this thing? It's concave up, then concave down, and then concave up, right? So it basically looks like that. Concave up, down, up. You with me? Okay, a little bit. Maybe. Um, and it's nowhere near as severe as what I've drawn. But let's just go with this. Where's my, um, where's my uh, coordinate system? Does it matter? This information won't change if I move this thing up and down, up and down. So when I start trying to pin it down on a graph, I've got to start plugging these points back into the original function so I can see where the hell they are. 
If I know what its shape is, where the hell on the graph is? It could be way up at millions and way down at billion, negative billions. I gotta start plugging it into the actual function to see where the hell this thing is. So the inflection point is at zero, zero, and there's another inflection point at two, uh, two thankfully four, this is not zero. Four. So it's going to be negative eight, negative 16, I mean. <laughs> Alright, 16 minus 32. Yep. Oh yeah, cool. eight times four. You guys with me? Okay, a little bit. Of course, this is all new, so hey, you got to let it sink in. I'm not going to suddenly say, now it's quiz time. That's what you guys look like. Uh, quiz is coming up. Um, so, last thing here with this problem. Uh, let's see, what do I not want to get rid of? That, all that information is here. Don't go to the problem. Good. So there's a min at what point? Where's there a min at? The three what? Three. Point that back into Y and whatever you get that first half. Three. Yeah, negative twenty seven. plug a 3 in, don't you get 3 to the 4th minus 4 times 3 cubed? You with me? Go with me for a second. Here's a little human calculator crap. Isn't this 3 three cubes minus 4 3 cubes? All right, 3 to the 4th is 3 3 cubes. 3 3 cubes minus 4 3 cubes is negative 1 3 cubed, which is negative 27. All right, so it's a really nice, quick way to do that, or just plug the damn thing you got. Alright, All right, so I got everything there is here. Yes, good, 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 good. Okay, so I'm going to take this away. And now we're going to try to graph this thing. Oh, and what was it? The function was, um, I forgot already. X to the fourth minus four. Minus four X there is. Cool. So what's the <laughs> Y intercept, for example? I can get all my regular stuff, too. Zero, zero. What's the x-intercepts? Not too bad, right? Yeah. Take an x cubed down, so it's zero. Oops, got it. Zero, zero, of course. And also four, zero. Right? Is that cool? Okay, so I can get my intercepts. I can get my normal stuff. Um, later, we'll even get asymptotes and all that kind of stuff, too. Yay. So now let's see if we can get all this stuff represented on the graph. So I can definitely plot my intercepts. So zero, and then how far up? Where's the interesting things? Three and two, good. So it looks like a decent scale here. I want to represent all of your important points. Y intercept is zero, zero, so it doesn't really tell me how high up and down it goes. Uh, I know that there's a min at 3, negative 27. So maybe my scale can be 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So at 3, negative 27, there's a min. Uh, what else do we know here? Any other points? The really sucky thing about interval notation is it looks like a point. So here we go. Inflection point at zero, zero. And at two, negative 16. And did I get all my x intercepts? No. Zero, zero, four, zero. So everything seems to be happening on that side. Okay. I'm going to so far. 
And I know all the old pre-calc stuff, like the end behavior. Are we just graphing y double prime? No, we're graphing the function. Oh. So everything we're doing in this section is analyzing the function through derivatives. Right? So the first derivative tells me the slopes and stuff, tells me where is it going up, where is it going down. The second derivative tells me what's it shaped like in those locations. Right? Where is it concave down, where is it concave oh, up. Oh, so we're not even drawing the second derivative. We are drawing the function itself. Yeah, and then we're, we're putting the we're using, all the critical critical points. Points. using all of this information we've got to graph the function itself. Exactly. Cool. Yeah, so this, this uh, end behavior should be, careful, x to the fourth, so it should be, oh, oh, be parabolic. Don't do that. That's crazy. So, so it kind of makes sense. My, my slope is down through zero, down, so it's coming down through here. Um, let's see. I got everything represented. So my, and it's concave up until zero, right? So that's why it's really good to mark all of these things. Inflection, inflection, minimum. So I kind of have rolled into my picture where my cup up and stuff changes and where it turns. So I know it's cup up back here until zero. And then what happens at zero for the concavity? It's an inflection point, so it's got to become down. cup down. Right? So it's probably not going to be that severe. So it looks like a backwards cubic through there, right? Mm -hmm. Which makes sense because if you graph, if you factor this thing, the zero factor comes from x cubed. So it looks like a backward cubic here, and then it's now it's cup. Let me make it a little more severe. Down, and then what happens here? Cup up, cup up. Cup up through the minimum, and then up through there. All right. It always looks roughly like parts of gross one used to at least. Or it's a piano. I don't know which one. That's a lot of these functions end up looking like that for some reason. Are you guys, if you label your points, now of course, I mean we have just gotten into this, right? So it's what's really hard is to figure out how to get all this information together up there, but if you just label your points. Then you just if you start cup up when you hit something that's got a little I and F. You know you got to change it to cup down. You don't have to kind of keep going back and forth between your intervals. The intervals are just to answer the question. They ask you on what interval is the concave up and down. Answer them. But when you go to graph it, all you care about is it's cup up right now. That's inflection. So now it's cup down. <coughs> inflection again. Now it's cup up. Are you guys? With me, I'm trying. There's a lot to throw at you about this, but I'm trying to give you practical how the hell to actually do these problems. Tips right now, because here's a problem for you to do. Quiz, don't you? <laughs> no, it's not a quiz. Any kind of quiz at all. So what I want you to do right now is get as far as you can on this. Only over if you hit a snag. 